Today we're in Galatians chapter 3. We're looking in verse 13 and 14. Even though we've already somewhat covered these verses, we didn't do what I wanted to do today, so we're going to do some more on this. I uh, have a lot of things I want to get covered, and I've already forgot one thing, so I'm redoing it now. Um, I had an interesting experience this week with um, a book somebody gave me, and it was um, about Bertrand Russell. Has anybody ever heard of him or know about him? Yeah, he was a famous logician who thought that truth could be found through logic, which, not of necessity, but in his case it was um, consequential, made him a rank atheist. And yet, growing up, he had a grandmother who was a very devout Christian who gave him a bunch of rules to do, uh, basically a legalistic kind of household. These are the kinds of things you do. These are the things you don't do if you want to be a good Christian kind of thing. And I'm not saying there, that there aren't supposed to be rules in a person's house. There certainly is. But she was overbearing and demanding. and. Um, he, he grew up and uh, went off to college and decided he wanted nothing to do with that kind of Christianity that did not have a personal relationship with the true and the living God and that, in his opinion, couldn't establish absolute truth. Of course, his problem was wherever he went, whether it was philosophy or mathematics or logic or wherever he went, nature, he had to start with something that we call axioms or postulates, and he didn't like that. He wanted everything to be able to be known for a fact. And even in the Christian belief, there are axioms, things we accept without proof, such as the existence of God. We don't seek to prove his existence. We walk by faith. We believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. So I wanted to mention that to you because I thought that fit pretty well in what I've been learning in the book of Galatians as far as whether we want to have a personal relationship with the true and the living God or if we want a set of rules to guide our life as the motiva motivating factor for serving our God. Uh, allow me to uh, begin our time in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your truth. We ask that you would reveal yourself to us, that we would see you in your glory, and that we would be conformed to the image of your Son. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that is ours in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have raised him from the dead and have um, made clear evidence that he is the Messiah, the Christ, and that he is the one to judge the world. And we thank you for the patience that you have shown to us and to all men in giving us time to repent. And yet I pray for those who have not trusted in the Lord that they would repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ even today that they would not be storing up for themselves wrath for the day of wrath. And we thank you for the resurrection that we have hope, hope for the future even despite the times and the days in which we live which where we might not have much hope in the things that men are doing. We recognize that all that is taking place is according to your sovereign design and plan and you will bring about the culmination of all history, even as you have planned from the beginning. We thank you that we have a God that we can trust, a God who has revealed himself to us, and a God who has given us his spirit, that we might know the truth and that we might have the power to walk in righteousness. Teach us today by your spirit that we would grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ, to be salt and light in this dark and corroding world, and bring glory to your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Redemption. How would you define the word 
redemption. This is how Webster defines it. The act, process, or instance of redeeming. You know, you got to love those definitions that use the word to define itself. Well, then you have to look up redeeming, so we'll look up redeeming. It says, serving to offset or compensate for a defect. Well, I heard this word yesterday quite a bit, uh, redemption, that one football team wanted redemption over another football team. Why? They were serving to offset or compensate for a defect. <laughs> it happened last year, but it was a defect nonetheless, so they were going to compensate for it. I guess. I, I don't know. I, I think of a different <laughs> concept when I think of redemption and redeeming, but this is how Webster defines it, so I guess it was an appropriate use of the word. We're going to look at this word in our uh, passage today and maybe come up with a different kind of uh, understanding as to what biblical redemption is, but I thought that was interesting as to how Webster would define it. We're looking in the book of Galatians and Paul is seeking to establish his authority as a true minister of the gospel. In fact, so much so that if you don't hold to his gospel, which is the true gospel, then you are accursed. And he has been showing by many uh, clear evidences that he is a true apostle and that his gospel is the true gospel. And yet, the Galatians were turning away from this true gospel so that as we had read for us this morning, Paul would call them foolish or empty-headed. They weren't thinking. They had come to conclusions that were, if you will, illogical. And he had three particular questions that dealt with the Spirit. He said in verse 2, Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? In verse 3 he said, Having begun by the Spirit, are you now perfected by the flesh? And in verse 5, he says, does, So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and work miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And then if we go down to verse 14, it talks about the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Paul is talking about, do you receive the Spirit by faith or law? Do you, are you perfected by uh, the flesh or by the spirit? Does the one who provides you the spirit work miracles among you do it by the law or by faith? So he's setting these two ideas in opposition to one another, whether it's the works of the law or by hearing with faith that you receive the spirit. And then he ends it in verse 14 talking about a promise of the spirit that was through faith. So he answers this question that the way an individual receives the Spirit and walks by the Spirit is through faith, not by works of the law. Well, let's think about how the Spirit is talked about or referred to in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel 11:6, it talks about King Saul. And it says, the Spirit came upon him mightily But in chapter 16, verse 14, it said, The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit replaced him. And right before that, in chapter 16, verse 13, it said, The Spirit came mightily upon David. Well, David, having seen what happened to Saul, that the Spirit came upon him and then departed, when he sinned, because that's why the spirit departed from Saul, was because of his sin. When David sinned in Psalm 51, verse 11, he said, Please, Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could be removed, even as we saw in King Saul. And David knew that he deserved to have the Holy Spirit removed from him, just like Saul did but he prays that the Holy Spirit would stay with him. 
and that he would be able to worship the Lord in spirit. How is the spirit referred to in the New Testament? Well, it gets a little bit different. It says in John chapter 1, verse 33, that John the Baptist baptized with water, but one was coming, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism was something that was recognized by Old Testament believers, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that was not fully understood. For you were baptized in water to be identified with something. If you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're basically identified with God. In John chapter 3, verse 5, it talks about that you need to be born of the Spirit, that there needs to be a new birth. And it needs to be a spiritual birth if you are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In John chapter 7 and verse 39, we read the following. In verse 38, he said, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who had believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So there is something about the giving of the Holy Spirit that seems to be promised here in John chapter 7, verse 39, for those who were believers, but it needed to take place after Jesus was glorified. And in John chapter 14, and that should be 16 and 17, not 6 and 7. Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Well, Jesus was their helper at this time. And he is going to pray to the Father that these disciples of his will get another helper. That he may be with you forever. See, Christ was departing from them. And he's going to ask God that they have a helper that's with them at all times. And that helper is identified in verse 17. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. When will that take place? When Christ is glorified. So how did that work itself out? Look in the book of Acts, chapter 1. Verse 4, he says, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for that which the Father had promised. What had the Father promised? The Spirit after Jesus was glorified. Well, Jesus is glorified at this time. But they were supposed to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said you heard of from me. Remember when I told you back in the book of John? Well, they didn't know it was back in the book of John, but back when I was with you? He says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So here's the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which the Father had promised, which Jesus had told them about previously. Look in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Just like Jesus said would happen, it happened. The Holy Spirit came down, filled them, and they were speaking with other tongues so that they might declare the glories of God to men of all kinds of languages. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, after Peter gives a sermon and they ask what they're supposed to do, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So for every believer, 
everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is this promise of the Holy Spirit since Jesus has been glorified. Turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So in this time of transition, when there was ignorance about the coming of the Holy Spirit, there were people who had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus who had not even heard of the Holy Spirit. These individuals come to Samaria. They tell them about the Holy Spirit, lay their hands upon them, and sure enough, as believers, they also receive the Holy Spirit. Now let's turn to Acts chapter 10, verse 44. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words. In other words, in God's mind, in God's opinion, Peter had said enough. Peter thought he had a little bit more to say. But after he had said enough, God, had, God was now free to use what he had said to do what he wanted to do, and that was to bring salvation to the Gentiles. So while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message, and all the circumcised believers, that would be the Jews, who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Don't these Gentiles need to become Jews first before they get the Holy Spirit? Don't they need to be circumcised and be directed into the law of Moses before they can receive the Holy Spirit? No. And the Jews were amazed at that. They were the chosen people of God. Surely you have to come through them in order to be saved and receive the Spirit. Well, yes, you did have to come through the Jews to be saved and receive the Holy Spirit. Through one Jew, whose name was Jesus, yeah, you had to come through him. And if that's what it means to come through the Jews, then yeah, you have to come through the Jews. But it wasn't through the legalistic system of Moses. It doesn't say you had to come through Moses. It says you had to come through Christ. So all these circumcised believers are amazed that this is taking place. So now we have a very different ministry of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. That whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and remains with them and indwells them since Jesus has been glorified. Now let's go back to Galatians chapter 3 and see how we lead up to this receiving the Spirit with faith and how Paul answers his own questions. It says in verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now let's go back and look at what Paul has said about the law. It says, as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Verse 10. Verse 11, no one is justified by the law. Verse 12, the law is not of faith. And now verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. If the law brings about a curse and we seek to be pleasing to God, we need to be redeemed from the curse. We need to re be redeemed from the curse of the law, and Christ is the one who accomplished this. Now what is the meaning of this word? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 and play spot the Greek word. Revelation chapter 5 
in verse 9, it says, And they sing a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Where is our Greek word? It's a trick question. It's not there. It's sort of there, but not really. The word I wanted you to say is purchased. Some of you got it correct, but incorrect, because our word is not there. The word purchased is there, but that's not our Greek word. In verse 9 of chapter 5 of Revelation, the word purchased is the word agorazo, which means to buy, to go spend money for something and get something in return, to purchase or to buy. In Galatians chapter 3, in verse 13, when it says Christ redeemed, and in chapter 4, verse 5, where it says so that he might redeem, it's the word ex agorazo, which means to buy out of. It means that there was a condition, something was in, and you bought it out of, say a puppy in a animal shelter. You don't agorazo that puppy. You don't just buy it. You buy it out of the animal shelter. You take it from where it is and you get it out of its condition. Yes, you had to pay money for it, but you got it out. That's our Greek word, to buy out of. Ex agorazo. Okay, let's turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 14, and see if we can find our Greek word. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. It says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. Where's our Greek word there? Well, you would think it's redeem, but it's not. Our Greek word is not there. This is a synonym of our Greek word. This is the Greek word lutrao. And this has the idea of buying something, but in a very different way. It means to pay a ransom. It means somebody is held captive, and you have to pay something to release them. So it says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. There had to be a ransom paid to redeem us from every lawless deed. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 8. First okay, Peter chapter 1 verse 8. 18? Okay, 18. Knowing that, yes, it's verse 18, thank you. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. There was a bondage that was your feudal way of life, and you inherited it from your forefathers. Now, Peter is writing to Jews who were scattered about as aliens in certain districts of Asia Minor. And he says, you inherited a feudal way of life from your forefathers, a legalistic do's and don'ts kind of religion. And you needed to have someone pay a ransom to get you out of that. And you would think that silver or gold would be good enough There are no more precious metals than silver or gold. They are the most valuable, maybe platinum a little bit more. But for the most common of metals that are uh, most precious, silver and gold 
would be what you think someone would use to buy someone out of a slave market. He says, no, you weren't redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold. Verse 19, you were redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. It took far more than what is common to man, silver and gold, to purchase man for God. It took the spotless lamb's blood to purchase men, to ransom men from their futile way of life. Let's see where our Greek word is in Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12, we read the following. And not through the blood of bulls and goats, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Where's our word? It's not there. Some of y'all are getting the hang of it now. The Greek word's not going to be there in any of these passages. And how do we know it's not in this passage? Because we're looking for a verb, and the word we think matches is a noun. So this is the noun form of the previous word lutrao, this is the word lutrosis. But it still has the idea of paying a ransom to release somebody. Now notice what it says in verse 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this creation, And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal release from captivity. The ransom is paid. Nothing needs to be paid or done in addition. No keeping of the law of Moses, no circumcision, not anything. He is the one who has entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now let's take a look at Romans chapter 3. Verse 24. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, again, this word has not appeared yet. But it's very similar to another word. It is apolutrosis. To pay the ransom, to release away from to get you out of there entirely. Appa means from or away from. So if you think of that as a preposition, you're getting it as far away from something as possible. Lutrosis means to pay a ransom. To put it together means to pay a ransom to get you as far away from you were as possible. You were justified, declared righteous as a gift, a free gift by his grace, his unmerited favor, through the redemption, the payment of a ransom to release you from your former manner of life entirely, which is in Christ Jesus. It is not in Moses. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay, so how are you supposed to know the difference between agorazo, exagorazo, lutrao, apolutrao, lutrosis, apolutrosis? 
Get yourself a Greek dictionary and look it up. Do your due diligence to find out what these words mean and when they're used in certain ways. And I, I seriously mean that. Or get yourself a Bible program or something. But know what these words mean. These are important words. This is not the definition you got from Webster earlier that said redemption is the act of redeeming. No, redemption is the payment. The payment of a ransom at times to get you out of and away from where you were. They're synonyms. That's why you read redeemed in one place and redeemed in a different place and they're different words, so it's not that big a deal. You don't have to get a Greek dictionary. You should. They're synonyms. They mean much the same, but they're very precious words. So what did Jesus pay a price for? What did Jesus pay the ransom for? Look back in Genesis, uh, Galatians chapter 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Do you realize what that's saying? That the law brought a curse and you were cursed and now a price has been paid for you to be released from the curse and the curse came from the law? Why would you put yourself back under this thing that brought a curse and brought about the death of Christ to get you out of it? We were enslaved to humanistic, self-righteous, legalistic do's and don'ts that we thought if we did them, we were righteous, and if other people did not, we could condemn them. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that you have been redeemed from such thoughts. You have been brought out of that and taken completely away from it. So what's the answer to the questions? Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? How could you have received the Spirit by works of the law? When the works of the law bring about a curse and Christ had to redeem you from that curse by paying a ransom. It had to be by faith. So what action was taken in order to pay this ransom, in order to pay this price? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, the just for the unjust. The righteous one hangs on the cross to pay for the sins of the people who put him there. Does that not strike you as strange? That the people who put Christ on the cross had to do so for Christ to accomplish the redemption he came to pay for? Yes, they were evil and wicked men, and what they did was the most heinous crime ever done by man, the killing of the Son of God. And yet it was according to God's design. Uh, sovereign design and plan that his son hung on the cross and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For on the cross we see the greatest demonstration of God's love that will ever be seen throughout all of human history. And we also see the greatest demonstration of his wrath. For when his son became sin, his son had to die. The wages of sin is death. So when Christ became sin, even though he never did commit sin, he had to die. Thus, we see the wrath of God. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. A propitiation, a satisfaction of divine wrath by giving of himself. So what are the results? 
It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What was the purpose or result of Christ's redemption? In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. What is the blessing of Abraham to the Gentiles? Well, look back in verse 8. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. Well, there it tells us. All the nations are blessed. How are they blessed? By God justifying them. The justification, the declaring righteous of Gentiles, was a blessing that was promised through Abraham to all the nations. So how does that come about? Through Christ becoming a curse on the cross. If Christ is going to bring about the blessing of Abraham to the Gentiles, he must die. What else happened? So that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Remember what Jesus said to Peter after Peter made the great confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? He said, we're headed to Jerusalem, and the Jews are going to hand me over to the Romans, and the Romans are going to crucify me, I'm going to die, and in three days I'll be raised from the dead. Raised from the dead? Sounds like glorification, right? That's how the Holy Spirit's going to have to come. Jesus is going to have to be glorified. In order for Jesus to be glorified, he has to first die. That's why Jesus is making very clear to Peter. Peter takes him off to the side and rebukes him and says, this will never happen to you. So right after he is blessed of God that man didn't reveal it to him, but the Father revealed it to him, now Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because you're setting your heart and your mind on the things that men are concerned about, not the things that God's concerned about. I'm still persuaded that Peter didn't listen to the whole thing. The, Roman, the, the Jews will hand me to the Romans, the Romans will execute me, and I will die, and in three days, not a long time, I will be raised from the dead. I would have gone, I want to see that. No, I would have been like Peter. But you would think a man of faith would go, whoa, I want to see that. Hey, listen to this, guys. Jesus is going to die and rise from the dead. It's only going to take three days. We're going to see it in our lifetime. You'd get fired up about that, wouldn't you? No, Peter said, this will never happen to you. All he heard was Jesus was going to die. How can I be persuaded all he heard was Jesus is going to die? Because his reaction after Jesus died, there was no hope. There was no going to the tomb on Sunday morning hoping to see the risen Christ. He had to be told by a woman who was there earlier to prepare Jesus for burial that Jesus was alive before he went and checked it out. He had no hope. He didn't listen. But Jesus is the one through whom the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. And he is the one who would cause the promise of the Spirit to be received through faith. Nothing about keeping the law of Moses in these results. Simply that Jesus became a curse for us. So that in order that the, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, and so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Anyone who tells you that there is something you must do to be justified is a liar and an instrument of Satan. Anyone who tells you that there is something you must do to receive the Spirit is a liar and an instrument of Satan. I say that because of what Paul said. Let him be accursed, who preaches a different gospel than what Paul preached. And Paul said it is solely based on what Christ did that any Gentile is justified and that anyone receives the Spirit of God. Conclusion. 
What does this teach us about God? John 6, 63 says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. What does the law depend on in order to keep it? The flesh. And how much does the flesh profit? Nothing. So what chance do you have of keeping the law? None. What chance do you have of being justified with the Spirit? The only one you got. That's your only chance. That's your only hope. What does this tell us about man? You would think that this would be the greatest news of all time, and it is, thus, the good news or the gospel. But not everyone receives it. Why not? Because they're a natural man and they cannot understand the things of God. But the spiritual man, he understands these things. If you understand these things, it's because you've been blessed of God to understand them. Not because you're much wiser than anyone else. If you understand these things, it's because of what Jesus said to Peter that one time. Man hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed it to you. Therefore, be thankful for what God has done in your life that he may not have done in someone else's. So what about responsibilities and realities? Acts chapter 15 verses 1 through 12 is a incident known as the Jerusalem Council. And it came about because as it says in verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. They were adding something to faith for salvation. If we look in verse 5, it says, some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up. Now, it says they had believed, and of course, you can find in the scripture where people who believe depart from Christ. So just because it says they believed doesn't mean they were true believers, but I'm going to accept the fact that they are. Otherwise, I don't know why it'd be put there. It says, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses way more than circumcision. And we're talking about the book of Deuteronomy, which alone would be burdensome. And what did they come up with? I don't know. Something about don't commit adultery and don't eat things strangled and don't eat blood. I, I, don't, I don't read the Ten Commandments here. I don't read tithing. I don't read anything of the law. They basically put no restrictions on the Gentiles because they understood, as Paul said, that by works of the law shall no flesh be justified, not even a Jewish flesh. Therefore, even we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith and not by works of the law. If the Jews cannot be justified by works of the law, what makes you think a Gentile can? That would be ridiculous. Nevertheless, in 1 Corinthians 6.20 and in chapter 7, Paul says, You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Because there is no law that you are under, so to speak, except the law of Christ, doesn't mean you're free to do whatever you want. Because you have been bought with this incredible price, not silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, you have a responsibility to glorify God in your body.
And what does this tell us about Christ? In 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says he became redemption for us. He is the payment. He paid himself to redeem us, to ransom us, to buy us out of the slave market of sin. He is our redemption. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. Strange and amazing things that the Lord has planned from the beginning of creation, but he does it to reveal his glory. Fanny Crosby wrote this, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Father, thank you for the incredible price you paid for us to be redeemed and justified and to be given of your spirit. Give to us truly thankful hearts that we might praise you with the glory that is due your name for all that you have accomplished for us. You are a great and an awesome God. Thank you.